All right, so we are live. My name is Jesse, and I'm the lead on the Conservation Stories Canada project, where over the next year, I'll be featuring stories coast to coast across Canada of some of the amazing people working to save species and habitats across the country. Today, I am joined by Adam Smith. He is a biostatistician with the Canadian Wildlife Service and Environment and Climate Change Canada, and an authority on bird populations worldwide. So thank you so, so much, Dr. Smith, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jesse. Fantastic. Yeah, so to start, I mean, I know a lot of the audience has been other conservationists across the country, but for those who might not know, what on earth does a biostatistician do? What does your day-by-day -day work look like? Yeah, so my day-by-day -day work is, uh, is, is all close to home. Uh, so, so there are biologists all across the country who are gathering observations on uh, birds, wildlife, and, and it is my job to take those observations and turn them into... Um, population trends, population uh, trajectories, uh, to take all the raw data and turn it into some sort of, ideally, some sort of understanding of what's happening to, to Canada's bird populations. Yeah, very cool. So you used to be one of these scientists. I know you did a lot of field work when you were younger, Indiana Jones style field work. So what prompted the shift? Was it just uh, a you know, bigger interest in the big picture or what led you to change uh, tack there? Yeah, so it was a whole bunch of things all at once, and and I got my start in as a field biologist working in northern Canada and doing all sorts of fun stuff, running around in the woods, um, mm. and and as time went on, I just I started to explore questions that um, that we it wasn't clear how to answer the questions I was interested in. Um, you know, I'd, I would, I'd have a sort of very what I thought of as a basic biological question about uh, you know are the is it more important to think about the amount of forest in the landscape, or is it more important to think about the configuration, the shapes of the forests in the landscape and edge densities and distances between forests and stuff like that? And, and then suddenly realized, well, suddenly for me, realized that the, the statistics um, didn't really exist to answer those questions well. And so I got forced to say, okay, well, I'm gonna have to understand the statistics a little bit more. And then, and then that kind of thing just kept happening. And uh, and I got more and more into this into the statistics and the numbers and the sort of data science uh, uh, and the coding and and <laughs> here I am. Here you are. Well, you certainly made good with it. You were one of the leads on this this big study that got released, highlighting the fact that in the last few decades we've lost three billion birds. So, what were some of the findings that you discovered in that? Like, what was the what was the data you used to make that analysis? And, and what are the sort of the the dire things that it, it told us? Yeah, and so that was that was just uh, just an incredible project to be part of. So such a such an honor to be to be part of that project. And um, and my job in that project was to do a lot of the math, um, but the math was almost trivial in relation to the fifty plus years of monitoring that has gone on uh, across North America to gather the information that that I you know the the numbers that I could crunch. Um, and so so we looked at the. Uh, the trends in the populations and the size of uh, our best estimate of the size of the populations of uh, over 500 of North America's bird species, almost almost all of them, uh, at least in the U.S. and, and Canada. Um, and we're missing a lot of the trop tropical and subtropical species in Mexico and uh, further south because the we just don't have the, the data yet, uh, although we're working and fixing that. But we took the population sizes, the population trends, and we combined them uh, in a model that accounted for all the uncertainties around the both sets of estimates. Uh, and we, in a nutshell, calculated the number of birds in North America for every year from 1970 up to 2017. And what we found is that that number has dropped by almost 30%. We've gone from approximately 10 billion birds. And those are birds coming back to North America in the spring uh, migrating from the tropics and the subtropics and coming back to North America to to lay their eggs and raise their young every year. We've gone from 10 billion to seven uh, in the last uh, in the last 50 years in in approximately my lifetime, um, give or take. Which is beyond tragic. I mean, it's an unfathomable number to consider that big of a loss of biodiversity in, in uh, again, a fairly short period of time, you said in your lifetime. So the, the good note about this study and, and sort of the scale of it is that it did provoke a lot of media attention. I saw this in a number of places, a lot of big organizations shared this out. So what do you make of that uptake in general? How is that impactful to you? And is it leading to concrete action? Is it just, did it just make people go, wow, how sad? Or are people going, wow, how sad, but here's what I can do about it. Are you seeing a big 
push to do conservation actions to mitigate that problem because of your study? Yeah, so so absolutely. I mean, that that paper has been had just had a tremendous response to it. And, and I think that makes sense. We knew that when we when we first calculated that number and we thought three billion birds, uh, we thought that, that number is going to resonate with people. At least we hoped yeah. it would. And, and it did. And um, and that makes sense because that's not just we're not talking a couple of rare species. We're talking about an entire class of organisms. We've lost 30 percent of them. Um, it, it's all birds across the uh, across the, at a continental scale. That's a tremendous change in the uh, in the the ecosystem, the biodiversity that that surrounds us. Uh, and and so so there's been a tremendous response to that, and there's been all kinds of activity, certainly on the you know the bird conservation organizations, organizations like Bird Studies Canada, uh, and uh, and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and the Audubon Society, and 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 others have uh, have. Um, really jumped on that uh, that message uh, yeah. in a really big way and, and have done all sorts of incredible things uh, in the last uh, little while, both from a science standpoint and from a policy standpoint as well. Sure. Um, but you know, at a broader society level, uh, those the the causes behind those declines are complex. And so there are there are not going to be simple fixes to those. Uh, and the recovery of that fifty year, pattern is going to is going to take some time yeah well so you know obviously that would be the case i'm glad to hear that the message has resonated so powerfully i'm glad to hear that organizations are really taking up the mantle and doing something about it uh, is there a success story that you can point to that those groups could model their efforts after are there an individual species or an ecosystem type perhaps in canada that's really had a an uptick in birds or a good success story that we can share yeah there's there's at least two of them that really stand out both from the results of that uh, that study and, and other similar studies, the State of Canada's Birds, uh, was a report that came out just a little while before that one. Um, and and the two really great news stories that that I think exactly like you said, it can can guide the way to recovering uh, some of North America's bird populations. Uh, one of them is waterfowl and and other wetland birds, and uh, and the recovery of waterfowl from declines that happened around the turn of the century and before that um, related to hunting and, and wetland loss um, has been incredible. And so, so waterfowl populations have increased over the last 50 years and it's largely a function of uh, improved harvest regulations and, uh, and uh, improved protections for wetland habitat. So waterfowl, absolutely, uh, there's lots of money and lots of thinking that's been put into protecting the habitat that waterfowl depend on, and that has had uh, that has had a, a, a tremendous effect on waterfowl populations. The other really wonderful um, uh, sort of good news story in conservation is a is a story that I bet lots of people listening to this have experienced in their daily lives um, when they've seen things like ospreys and bald eagles uh, and peregrine falcons in the last few years. When I was a kid, forty ish years ago. Um, you, you never saw those birds. Uh, they, they just weren't around. Many of them were on the endangered species list. Uh, last year, peregrine falcons in Canada were taken off, maybe two years ago, anyway, were taken off the endangered species list. Uh, populations of raptors in general, uh, birds of prey, have rebounded since, the, since essentially DDT, the, the pesticide, uh, was banned in the 70s and, and 1980s. And so that was a situation where uh, it was a pesticide that was used in agriculture. It was tremendously useful from an agricultural perspective and from controlling insect populations or pest insect populations. Um, but then as the science progressed, we discovered that it was, uh, it was uh, effectively, it was bioaccumulating in the, in the environment and poisoning some of the, the top level predators, uh, particularly birds of prey. Once we discovered that from a scientific perspective, then there was a societal effort uh, to to change what we were doing as a society to ban the use of that pesticide, uh, and once it was removed from the from the environment, the bird populations recovered. So it was you know, two examples of protecting habitat, but also um, informed action. So so relying on the science, understanding the problem, and then acting on the the best available science. 
I love when science-based policy decisions actually get made, and that's really heartening to hear those two stories. I mean, even in my lifetime, when I was a kid, I don't recall seeing birds of prey. And now when I walk around my block in Toronto, I can barely walk 10 feet without being nearly hit in the head by a red-tailed hawk, which is really exciting. Never when I have a camera, incidentally, um, to prove that they're there, but they are there. It's very exciting. Um, and so. You know, to wrap this up, this is, uh, again, such a great story. I mean, it's unfortunate that we have the backdrop of such loss, but I'm glad that it's leading to some positive policy decisions and certainly an uptick in, in public awareness. Um, why do you personally like birds? I mean, what's the, you know, birds are, are easily the most loved large group of animals. There's people, yeah. you know, so many societies, so many groups. But personally, what's the draw for you? I'm curious. Yeah, so for me, it's, it's uh, well, it's one thing to start off with, and, and it wasn't initially, but it has become over the last 20 years as my career has progressed. I love birds because there are thousands of volunteer birders across the continent who go out and collect standardized information on birds. So as a statistician, <laughs> birds are incredible. We know more about birds than we do about any other facet of the of our of our natural ecosystem and it's largely because of volunteer birders working through organizations like bird studies canada and the cornell lab of ornithology and uh and others um who've been going out and collecting observations for the last 50 years and compiling them to major data sets and so so birds are great from a data perspective they're just they're just tremendous but part of the reason we have those birders those keen birders is because birds are magnificent birds are incredible i mean think Think about how how much they inspire poets and and songwriters and artists. The 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 uh, you know the the visual beauty of them, their songs, the fact that they don't seem to mind us. You know they'll be singing right outside your window. Uh, your cardinals and blue jays and everything. It, they're just incredible. Then they fly. Like what? How they do <laughs> magic, right? Like who, who made who would design the bird? I don't know. That that was that was a good day. That is, uh, I love, uh, sorry, the, the multifaceted answer is amazing, but the idea that they're just so good for statistics is the best. So thank you for that. Um, and th it's true. I mean, we've got these societies, we've got things like the Christmas bird count, which I think is the largest citizen science and oldest in the entire world. Um, I naturalists provide so many opportunities and, and something that I've touched upon with a few speakers in, in this interview series is that benefit of citizen science. You can actually contribute to real science. So it's nice to hear that that is the case, that, you know, your average run of the mill person, if they want to go out and just be in love with nature, their efforts to collect that data can really help make, again, policy decisions, make statistical analysis easy, and really lead to some good. So, um, Adam, this is great. I, I always love the chance to chat, and I really appreciate this. Is there any, I guess, last thing about, um, you know, upcoming studies or, or bird conservation in general that you can share with us before we wrap up? There's, I mean, there's all kinds of fun stuff. And as a statistician, that that paper, that three billion birds paper, is leading to all sorts of incredible new science. Uh, we are working at at integrating across many different data sets, almost all of them coming from volunteers across the uh, across the continent, integrating information, building um, large computer modeling. Uh, databases that uh, that are going to tell us even more, not just about how populations are changing, but the causes behind those changes and predictions for how we can maybe can help some of those populations recover. Very, very cool. I, I think I'm going to have the hardest job of linking in all this information because there's just so much that we covered, uh, but I'm looking forward to doing that and giving people a chance to learn even more about the work that you're doing and the work that groups around the world are doing. So Adam, thank you again so much for sitting down with me and I really, yeah. really appreciate it.